Hi, this is lesson three in the 11 lesson course on an introduction to Plato. Hopefully you enjoyed lesson two, it's a short biography on, on Plato. As the biography said, Plato writes in a dialogue format. So he writes as if he were writing a play. And he quite literally has. Um, his main protagonist, the main sort of actor in his play is always Socrates, who is his mentor in real life. And he would say, Socrates, you know, enters stage left and says this. Adamantius, in response, says this. Thrasymachus, in response, says this. It's a, it's a, a conversation, which is a, an interesting literary technique that he uses and probably actually allows him to get away with a few things you, you couldn't get away with uh, 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 without using that technique. But that's by the by. Another, another thing which the biography doesn't say, but I personally find that interesting uh, to mention, is that we only really know Plato and indeed his mentor Socrates and his famous student Aristotle because um, they were preserved in the East. Uh, they were pre uh, preserved by uh, the Muslims and the Arabs who, who were captivated by this philosophy as well. We in, in sort of Western Europe had a little problem for a few hundred years where we kind of, you know, burnt all the books and uh, that didn't work out so well for us. So then um, when the, uh, the scholastics in the 12th and 13th century came to uh, rebuild the universities, Plato obviously, ironically, being the first person to build a university, what he called the academy. Um, and, you know, we, a couple of thousand years ago, rediscovered the university in, in Sorbonne and Cambridge and Oxford. And um, uh, they, the, the, the schoolmen, or called the scholastics, they wanted to teach something. They had to have a text to teach, other than the Bible, which was obviously the main text. And um, so they, they looked around and really all they could find eventually were these texts of Plato and Aristotle, which had been preserved in, in Arabic. Um, and, uh, and that's interesting, um, both in the historical narrative, but also because we really now tend to see all uh, Plato and Aristotle as these big tavern figures, but they weren't actually always as important as they now seem in their present day. But we unfortunately don't have all the other philosophers, and especially we don't have the sophists work, not in the number or the, the, uh, the, the quality that we wish. Because Plato is very much against these sophists. If it's seen as its most simplistic, there's one group of philosophers here, which Plato sort of champions, and then there's another group here, which are the sophists, who in Plato's dialogues, he always pits Socrates against these sophists. Many of them actually being historically real people, but probably caricatured somewhat and, and their arguments simplified. But if we were to, to, to look at that, that contest, um, as if it were um, were that simple, um, then you can see the sophists are saying that knowledge is a relative concept. One of them famously says, man is the measure of all things. And what it means by that probably is that, that um, there is no real definition of truth which is objective to us. There is no sense in which I can say my knowledge of the world is any better or more truthful than yours. And where that becomes particularly important is in regards to uh, morality, because what they seem to be saying, well not all of them by any means, is that there is no good, that there's no point in being good if one can get away with it. And Plato talks about this um, through his famous uh, allegory of the, the Ring of Gyges, um, where if you were to become invisible, would you try and get away with things which weren't uh, deemed good, um, simply because you could get away, get away with it. And there's an interesting sort of debate there. But we, what I want to focus on is, as I say, is epistemology, which really is, is the nub of this, because if that's what the sophists are saying, then what Plato wants to say is, is that we should be good, we should, should act morally, because there is such a thing as absolute truth and we can have knowledge of that truth and the highest truth is the good and he quite literally in a very famous passage compares the good to like the sun because the sun is, 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 is what gives light and allows us to see and in that sense the good is what allows us to see all truth as well and this is a, a very very important distinction and, and, and Plato heavily rests on this metaphor of, of 
of the mind's eye, of somehow that we see truth. But he didn't believe that we saw it in this world, this world of tangible things, of material. He felt there was a world beyond our world, beyond this world of matter. And that, that other world was a truer world. It was, it was a world which was more perfect because it was more eternal and unchanging. And I think that really is the nub of it. And in that sense, you can see Plato as an inheritor of this, um, this, this, this team of philosophers who are against the sophists. And this team of philosophers, one of their most important philosophers is Pythagoras. And Pythagoras, many of you might have heard of, because they still teach Pythagoras' theorem in mass, mass classes, and um, which is about right, right angle triangles and about how you find out the length of different lines and, and, and angles. And uh, I'll leave that for, for, for a mass lesson, either from your school or hopefully you can pick one up on, uh, on uh, teachyourself.org. Um, the point being is that these were the first mathematicians, and the only real mathematicians of their day were geometers. Geometry is obviously the study of, of shapes and lines, and this was groundbreaking stuff. Now we see mass of it, rare but dull, but this was wow, this is groundbreaking stuff at the time. And what they were real, and what people like Pythagoras were seeing, was that in fact there was this truth about triangles in an abstract sense. So it, imagine making a triangle, a triangle of wood, let's say for example. It, well, what holds true for that triangle of wood that you made would hold true for a triangle um, made of mud by someone else. It would hold true for any triangle, a triangle drawn on a piece of paper, a triangle even imagined in the mind. If you were to use Pythagoras' theorem, you will be able to calculate the lines and the angles and the areas. And, and it doesn't matter what that triangle is made of. It doesn't matter what matter it has. It doesn't matter who made it. It holds true. And this captivates, this idea captivates Plato. And he sees it as the answer to all knowledge. In today's world, we kind of have a tendency to say, well, maths is one type of knowledge and, and, and the social sciences and philosophy and, uh, and English and, and these sorts of subjects are, are a separate type of knowledge. But not for Plato. Plato, it's all one, including, most importantly, moral knowledge. 